Marhaban wa ahlan bakum fi baranamij dakhil Washington. Ma'akum mudifakum Robert Satloff. Safara Rais Trump ilal sharq al awsat hamalan risalat jadida hawl awliyat al siyasa al amerikiya. Zahaba wa wala el juhud li ijad makan fi sharq al awsat li Iran. Wa badlan minhu kan hunak tarkiz ala hazimat al tatarruf. Min janib kulmin el dawla el islamiya wal jumhuriyat el islamiya. Walakin fil saudiya hamala el reis Trump baad el risail el ukhra aidan. Fi dawla taftakir fiha el nisa ila absad el hukuk el fardiya. Mithla el haq fi el aish be mufradihun wal sifr be mufradihun au hatta kiyadat siyara. Khutabihi el mujah. للزؤماء العرب والمسلمين داء إلى المساواة بين الرجل والمرأة تلك الرسالة أبرزتها كلمات والأفعال زوجته ميلانيا وهي عارضت أزياء ناجحة وابنته إيفانكا وهي سيدة أعمال ناجحة أي أثر سيكون لدولة الرئيس ترامب للمساوات بين الرجل والمرأة في الدول العربية والمسلمة ماذا تاكس حول المعركة دون الإدلوجية المتطرفة وماذا تاكس حول شخص والسياسات إدارة ترامب لمناقشة هذه الموضوعات يسرني أن أراهب بالباحثة أكاديمية وخبيرة بالسياسات حول دار المرأة في الحياة الآمة وخاصة في الشرق الأوسط وهي كنت ديفيس باكر Welcome back to Dackel, Washington. I'm sitting here with Kent Davis Packard to discuss the state of women in politics around the world, and especially in the Middle East. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Rod. So let's let's take a broad look first. Um, are women in politics, is their status advancing or receding broadly around the world? That's a very good question. Um, I think you have several things happening. You have a lot of box checking, but not a lot of implementation. So for example, you have UN Resolution 1325, which is uh, promoting women in uh, peace processes and um, become, allowing women to be more involved in peace negotiations. But at the same time, they're not actually, countries are not actually implementing that and welcoming women into the process. Um, for CEDA, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, you have a lot of countries ratifying, but ratifying with reservations. And so they are allowed to get around some of the guidelines that CEDA is proposing um, simply by uh, having these reservations. And the UN allows the, the countries to still be on the record as having ratified the international treaty, although it's not effective. And if you were to focus specifically on questions of political leadership, do we see women uh, uh, taking more of the reins in countries around the world? Yes, actually you do. Um, I think it's very important that um, in the recent visit by Trump to Saudi Arabia, uh, in promoting women's leadership, the United States walk the talk. The United States is actually 100th. There are 100 countries ahead of, of the United States um, in terms of women's participation in national parliaments. And, um, That's horrible, also, isn't it? Yes, and uh, Rwanda is number one with 63%. The United States has 19%. Um, and then the United States also ranks 45th in the Global Gender Gap Report. So if the United States, for example, wants to promote women's, women in political leadership, we have to walk the talk. Um, so, but you see in other countries, like the, the United Arab Emirates, for example, with eight women ministers, a greater percentage of women in their, in their national parliament, they're equivalent to a parliament than in the United States. So you see uh, that kind of progress in the Middle East. Um, and uh, they are uh, making change from the top. That's their strategy, um, showing leadership by example. Now, their laws haven't changed. There still is a very restrictive family law 
women have to have a male guardian to work, travel, have cu a custody of their children. The interesting thing about this is that culture is changing. And you see that um, male guardians actually aren't preventing their daughters from working, from di divorcing if they so choose, from marrying whom they wish, from uh, uh, pursuing their dreams. And that's in the UAE. Um, and that's also in Kuwait. So while the laws exist, culture is actually transforming. This is little by little. It's not everywhere. There are still very conservative families preventing their daughters from uh, even leaving the house, for example, in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And when you refer to top-down uh, political change, especially in terms of, say, parliamentary representation, are these um, uh, mandates from government that certain percentages of parliaments have to include um, uh, women, or are they actually popularly elected um, in free and fair elections? It depends on the country. Um, quotas have actually failed. They failed in Yemen. I watched the Women's Union, union in Yemen um, not able to galvanize the support from other women's groups in 2008. The government turned down their proposal to have a 30% quota in parliament. In the UAE, it's, they are appointed. The ministers obviously are appointed. It is, is become more of a norm for women to be in leadership positions in the Middle East. Um, some of them, th their ministerial positions are related to gender and family, social issues, rather than the more mainstream core issues. And that they've been criticized for that. But you'll see, again, in the UAE, for example, um, the Minister of Economy was a woman. Um, that was the fir their first woman minister. Uh -huh. So there is precedent being set in the Middle East for leadership um, at the highest levels in um, positions that are not necessarily only related to the family or women's issues. Mm -hmm. So um, you referred earlier to President Trump, who was um, uh, in the Middle East recently, finished up a tour in Saudi Arabia and in Israel. Now, in Saudi Arabia, he spoke to this massive uh, group of Arab and Muslim leaders. Uh, I'm not sure if there were very many women in the room. No, there were not. And um, now he spoke of women in the greater context of social inclusivity. So he talked about ethnic minorities, religious minorities. Um, and I think the fact that Ivanka, his daughter, was in the room, it was important. She met with Saudi businesswomen, Saudi leaders. Um, she was criticized for only meeting with elite women. And I think we could do better. Our embassy could uh, work on having our our leaders meet with the everyday women whenever we travel to these countries. Um, but I think overall it was beneficial for her to set an example. She's a savvy, smart businesswoman, and she was there. And um, But when she does, and I hope she will, meet with everyday women in the Middle East, um, she'll find that it is the class differences in the Middle East that um, cause and promote a culture of resentment towards the elite and by association towards the West and Western culture. And even the elite women of the Middle East, um, because of being parts, a part of societies based on hierarchy, uh, will have resentment towards the West and attempt to reinforce their own superiority. Uh, and then it's even more complicated than that. Women in the Middle East and North Africa often bear the burden of um, representing what it means to be an Islamic state. Because women provide visible proof of the degree to which a state is Islamic, and that is in their dress, in their being confined behind the walls of their homes, um, their social segregation, not driving, for example, in Saudi Arabia, not working outside the house. The irony is that family law, which requires a male guardian's approval of women's rights to travel, marry, work, divorce, um, uh, is actually not the result of inherent, inherent Islamic practice. If you look at pre-Islamic European family law, you'll find exactly the same restrictions on women that you see now today in the Middle East. Um, it's the patriarchal system, the traditional norms of patriarchy that, that are all pervading. Um, it's not what a man did between 570 AD and 632 AD. Um, but now I think we're at a turning point 
Um, I don't think we are going to see these traditions last, particularly because women in the Middle East are going back to the Quran, reinterpreting and finding out that with, a, with their interpretations of the Quran and the Hadith, uh, they, they come out with a different set of norms that can be just as easily gleaned from Islam as the more restrictive ones. Okay, when we come back, we're going to dis discuss more about the relationship between women's rights and the fight against extremism. And then we'll discuss how all this uh, connects to the role of women inside the Trump administration back here in the United States in just a moment. Again, our guest today is Kent Davis Packard. She is one of Washington's leading experts on the role of women in foreign policy, especially in the Middle East. Kent is currently an adjunct professor of Middle East Studies and American Foreign Policy at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, from which she also received her doctorate degree. And previously she served as co-director of the Women's Learning Partnership a partnership of 20 international women's organizations located primarily in Muslim-majority countries. As a presidential management fellow, she played a key role in launching the State Department's Women in Public Service Project. She also managed the Egypt Desk's human rights portfolio and served for the Pentagon in Iraq and the State Department in Syria. So let me ask you about um, uh, the focus of Donald Trump's trip in Saudi Arabia, which is the fight against radical extremism, and to ask, is there a connection between fighting radical extremism and promoting women's equality? There's absolutely a connection. Um, when you promote women's equality, when, you ask, when women stand up for their rights, um, they are automatically entering a discussion about religion because right now in the region it is so-called Sharia law that is preventing them from having their complete and full rights. What women's organizations are actually doing and what they've caught on to is this new strategy which is to simply open dialogue. Women's organizations are creating safe spaces for communities to actually talk about religion. Right now that's a taboo subject. That's the danger right now because fundamentalists can capitalize on the fact that, uh, that religion is not questioned, that religion is about rote memorization, it's about dogmatism, it's about rules, it's not about love, it's not about spirituality, it's not about that dynamism of the relationship between an individual and God. And what you see women doing, are step, they're stepping forward and saying, well, let's talk about this. Um, here's what happens when I can't work, I can't travel, uh, I, my husband's beating me and I can't get a divorce. And suddenly you have empathy in the community because women's organizations are providing this safe space to talk about it. The late writer um, Fatima Mernisi, she's Moroccan, she wrote wonderful works of fiction that were subversive. She often set them in the 1940s but was really talking about today and that's how she was able to publish and um, she had a, a civil society caravan in which she opened dialogue throughout Morocco about women's rights. Um, she said that the, the root causes of fundamentalism actually have nothing to do with um, religious conviction but in fact have more to do with rapid modernization and the colonial experience. I can, t I can tell you I have a strong debate with that, uh, with that theory, but um, uh, let me ask you about the other side or an other side of this equation. Um, I've seen numbers that suggest that um, up to 10% or so of ISIS fighters, of Islamic State fighters are women, with a slightly higher percentage among uh, uh, ISIS foreign fighters, that is, with a slightly higher percentage even of the American uh, foreign fighters, somewhere about 13, 14%. What should we make of these numbers? Is that high, is that low? Um, uh, and, and why would any women, of course, why would anyone, but why would any women join the Islamic State? Well, I think you have to look at the economy and I think you have to look at 
people wanting meaning in life and looking for something that uh, you have a very high rate of unemployment among youth. You have a youth bulge. Um, I think it's 80% of the of people in the region are under the age of 30, and the unemployment has skyrocketed. So uh, for men, why first of all, why would men join? They, they have that sense of community, that meaning in life, and then. Uh, what happens, what do women bring to the, the ISIS community? Well, women allow them to form that basic unit, of, that basic social unit, which is the family. Without that, you can't form a society. ISIS needs women to form their community, their society, um, and it, they provide companionship, they provide all of the things that uh, an ISIS fighter would um, want to have while you know but 10 percent is is a relatively small number to me the really important thing the trend that you're seeing is the women who are speaking out against isis and that's a far greater percentage let's let's turn our discussion back home for a minute uh, we've been talking about the uh, the role of women in the middle east um, you earlier s referred to the um, um, uh, uh, quite regrettable um, status of women in American political life. Let me shift and ask you about uh, not just women in the Middle East, but women in the Trump administration. How would you assess the appointments that President Trump has made, and, and how do you think it compares with uh, where women have been in previous uh, presidential administrations? Well, in terms of numbers, it's not so different. There have always been very few women appointed by American presidents, and we're um, not seeing much of a change, although there should be. And I think that the real problem is that we, we continue to tolerate so few women in our own country's leadership positions. Um, and so now there are four. Um, uh, now, you have a very strong uh, UN ambassador, even though she was an unlikely candidate, with different set of experiences um, than the usual, but um, she has shown herself to be pretty fearless, and uh, she has also stood very strongly when we receive criticism for being um, heartless, for example, in the Middle East on, on issues such as the Syrian refugee crisis. She points out that the United States is the number one donor. This is Nikki Haley. Um, and she has also um, been very strong on, um, for example, Bolivia wanted to have a closed door session um, after the chemical weapons attack. She refused and countries agreed. Um, she, she stands up for human rights and that is what our UN ambassador should be doing. Um, we have Betsy DeVos um, and yes, she Secretary has- Secretary of Education. Secretary of Education who has received criticism, but not because she's a woman. And I think that's important. It's not based on gender. And I think that's a good thing. Um, I think what, you, what we really need to um, look at is not so much what Trump has done, because it doesn't differ from the other presidents, but uh, the fact that the American people are still tolerating the fact that it's so few women. So few women have been appointed, and it hasn't been a major issue. It has not been something that's raised. Um, I think that the uh, Women's March and now the support among American women and the solidarity that we've seen across the globe with American women and their dismay at um, the fact that we did have another candidate who was for, for president who was um, highly competent, uh, lost an election to someone who did speak very poorly about women. Um, and that, that, I think something will come of that. It, it will be in a future election, but uh, we are waking up to the fact that we have so few women in leadership positions, and that's the, import, that's the key learning here. It, it, do you think that Hillary Clinton's loss uh, pushes back the day that women will be at the highest levels of our political leadership, or does it energize women and energize others in our public life to say, we have to uh, uh, double our efforts, um, uh, otherwise it will be a very long time. I think it absolutely energizes women. I think we've already seen that with that the astounding, that was the largest protest in history. Um, so I, we're, I think our efforts have already doubled. I, I'm now launching for the first time um, a new curriculum at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies that focuses on the contributions of women. 
Columbia University SIPA, uh, Professor Yasmin Urgas is establishing an academic consortium for professors at the leading schools of international relations um, uh, to bring together resources for these schools on how to um, help more women become involved in public service in the Women, Peace and Security um, initiative. And um, it's, there is a movement. It's happening very, it's, it's very clear that um, Secretary Hillary Clinton's loss in, in that we did have a major gain. So this is a hopeful ending. Yes. I, I'm very hopeful. I think that we are at a turning point. I think that the world is awakening to uh, uh, new patterns of behavior because they're seeing what happens when, when you don't collaborate, when, you, when you're competitive instead of inclusive. Um, I think something's happening that's never happened before. Kent Davis Packard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you today for having me. Washington. Behave Nasilu il Nehea Tadahil Halka min Baranamage Dakil Washington. Either Kenneth Ladekum Eya Istaf Sarat, O Ta'alikat, Harul Havahil Halka, Wa Khasatan Harul El Daur El Mutahir, Lil Mara, Fiba Ladekum, Arju An Tarasaluni Mubasharatan, Ala Anwan El Barid Electroni Atali Inside Washington at Elhura.com. Ma Kum Robert Satloff. Shukran lakum wa illa laka.